Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, once more we come to you, inviting you to come to us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the second scripture lesson today comes from one of the little books near the end of the New Testament, the epistle of 1 John. We'll hear a passage from chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Listen for God's word. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey God's commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey God's commands. And God's commands are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. For who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. So there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In last week's New York Times magazine, there was a a celebration of sorts, an acknowledgement that over the last hundred years, the average human lifespan had literally doubled. A century ago, babies born in India or Bombay often didn't survive into their 20s, but today the average life expectancy in that country is in the 70s. A child born a hundred years ago in England or America might have done well to live into their 40s. But today, many enjoy life expectancies in the upper 70s and low 80s. So how was all this accomplished? In reality, it's not something big, but the accumulation of many little things. A vaccine that meant that you wouldn't die of smallpox. An antibiotic that meant an accidental scrape wouldn't lead to a deadly bacterial infection, or a chlorine additive in your drinking water that protected you from cholera. The journalist who wrote the article described it as this, quote, invisible shield that's been built piece by piece over the last century, keeping us ever safer and allowing us to stay farther from death. Now, what's interesting is that in the current pandemic, suddenly the invisible shield has become visible. Living a long and healthy life, we all now recognize, is dependent on lots of little things and the good work of many who are perhaps anonymous to us. Medical scientists, hospital workers, drugstore employees, public health officials, and on and on. We see more clearly now how all of our lives are interconnected and how we're all in this together. Over the past century, it wasn't just one thing that increased human life expectancy. It it was lots of things. It was a chorus of voices. It was hundreds of acts. There were examples of those who went before us that we follow, as well as our commitment to care for those who will follow after us. All of that was needed for human life to increase. Now, in the same way, no one comes to faith because of one single thing. Faith is the result of lots and lots of little things, or as it says in the book of Hebrews, it is part of a great cloud of witnesses. I want you to think about the path that each of you took to be a part of this Sunday worship service today. To be here today actually involved centuries of teaching the faith from one generation to the next. It involved scholars writing books on theology, preachers offering sermons and homilies. It involved people who told the story of Christ to others, who wrote down the Gospels, 
who would translate the Bible into countless new languages, who would create works of art and architecture to physically embody the good news of our faith. And it involves simple things. It involved families coming to church, Sunday school teachers sitting in pews while attending a wedding or a funeral. And it involved regular rituals like saying together the Lord's Prayer or sharing the bread and the cup of communion or watching as the waters of baptism are poured onto countless heads. Now it's also true that not all of these things have been done perfectly over the years. There have been lots and lots of bad sermons preached. I'm sorry for that. There have been lots and lots of bad theologies that have been proclaimed inside church walls. Theologies that were racist, that were anti-gay, that were anti-women, that were nationalistic falderall and foolishness. But God has not been defeated by these things. The invisible shield of faith has not been broken by the sins and the failings of the ages. No, it remains strong thanks to the grace of God and as we heard from that reading from 1 John, thanks to a particular trio of witnesses. The writer of 1 John actually speaks about three things that proclaim and testify to what it means to be a Christian. Water, blood, and the Spirit. So let's start with water. Today we had the chance to celebrate several baptisms. You saw water poured into the font. We spoke about being cleansed and washed from sin, of being welcomed into a new community. That very act has been done for millennia. It goes back to the old Jewish rites of cleansing before people entered into synagogues and temples. It goes back to the baptism of John the Baptist in the waters of the River Jordan and the literal baptism of millions, if not billions, of people over the years. See, we're not simply born into the faith. Faith isn't handed to us like a document or a birth certificate. We enter into faith through rituals, like being baptized, through parents who bring their children forward or others who step up on their own to the font. It's a one-time initiation event that takes a lifetime to finish. Now, in the act of Christian baptism, there are echoes of all the other times we've been washed, bathed, showered. Remember what it was like to play in a bathtub as a child, to wash your own child or a niece or a nephew to splash, to scrub, to put in bubble bath, to then be dried off, to be wrapped in a towel, to be loved, and to be nurtured unconditionally. All of these are witnesses to what it is like to be made clean, to belong. And in that way, they are witnesses to faith. Now consider the second, the witness of blood. The writer in 1 John, when the word blood is mentioned, more than likely is referring to the blood of Jesus, that which was shed when Christ was crucified on the cross. And so we talk about that act as a sacrifice of love, of blood that was shed for us. Now, the fact that we're alive means that blood is coursing through our bodies. It is circulating through the arteries and veins, bringing oxygen to our organs. It's the very stuff of life. We've each shed blood at some point by cuts and scrapes and gashes. We've used band-aids and stitches to try and keep the blood inside us. We've maybe given blood to help others. We've talked of caring for family members as our blood relatives. And we've wept when blood has been shed by soldiers on behalf of others, or when there's been blood shed by innocent victims on the streets of our own cities. So I want you to think about the time you've been very much aware of blood when your own blood pressure was perhaps too high, when a crying child came to you with a cut, when a hospital procedure required a transfusion. It's all quite 
serious stuff, but it's also humbling because it reminds us each how fragile and precious life is. The memory of Christ's sacrifice calls to mind the other sacrifices that we've known in our life or that we've seen and benefited from. The sacrifice of a mother, of her literal blood and placenta in giving birth to us. The sacrifice of parents and family to make sure we're cared for over the years of our lives. The sacrifices of those invisible members of our community to keep food on the shelves and medicine in the stores and trash off our streets. See, water and blood, whether from Christ's life or from the lives around us, both of them are witnesses of our faith. And then lastly, to add to those is the third witness of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is found throughout the whole Bible. It's moving over the face of the deep in the beginning of time when creation emerged from chaos. It was there in the, in the souls that were stirred by those that heard the words of Christ, whose lives were healed or transformed by his touch, by his presence and love. It's there in the quickened breath of the women who raced away from the empty tomb to tell others that Christ had risen. It was there in the windswept room of Pentecost when frightened disciples found the courage to, to go back out into the streets with the news of resurrection hope for a hurting world. And it's there in the, in the simple prayers that we offer in church or at home at a meal or at bedtime. It's in those connections that bind us together no matter how far apart we might even be today. I want you to think about the spirit that's moved and surrounded you even on this day. This is a Mother's Day. You likely have rituals of your own for today. Maybe giving flowers or sending a card. Maybe making a call to a living mother or saying a prayer of gratitude for a mother or grandmother now deceased. And maybe the Spirit moves in your time together so that you spend part of today telling stories and laughing, remembering what it was like to grow up. Remember what first brought you and your spouse together. Remembering what happened on graduation day or when you had your first job. What it was that stuck with you when you were there for a funeral of a loved one what you hope for when you look around at this troubled nation, when you picture re-emerging from a pandemic, when you see in the eyes of children the promise of those who will inherit the world. See, the Spirit moves through all of those stories, and it's the same Spirit that was there at the beginning of creation that blew forth from the empty tomb on Resurrection Sunday that inspires us in poetry and art and music, it's the spirit of hope. It's the spirit of confidence. It's the spirit of truth. It's the spirit of new life in Christ. And with water and blood, the spirit is a witness of faith. So in conclusion, I want you to think about all of this in this way. There were many things that led to the doubling of life expectancy over the past century. There were scientists and activists. There were reformers changing law. There were women and men who protected their children by washing hands, by getting shots, by quitting smoking, by wearing masks during pandemics. All of these, many things, were witnesses to good health and the promise of long life for all of God's children. And in the same way, there are many, many witnesses for the Christian faith. It has never been just one act. It's never just been one moment in time or one person, even the Son of God. It has always been a group effort, a salvation history that's unfolded over the years. Now, occasionally, we focus in and our attention goes to the rich heritage of our faith, the rituals of seeing baptism water glistening on the head of a newly baptized person, the taste of bread and cup that we name the body and blood 
of a crucified Lord. And when our spirits are enlivened, lifted, when our lips proclaim good news that Christ is alive, and we share that hope and love with one another. See, that's the incredible trio of witnesses of water, blood, and spirit. And all of them involve you. All of them include you. All of them depend on you. And that's the way of faith that literally conquers the world. And it's not burdensome, and it's not hard. So come join the great cloud of witnesses, because it's where you've always been meant to be. Thanks be to God. Amen.